Thank you. Or, uh, yeah. There's something you can't cure. No. Chair will call the November 1st, 2020 meeting of the City Council to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Will do. Alderman Redpath. Here. Alderman Gregory. Here. Alderman Williams. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Here. Alderwoman Purchase. Here. Alderwoman DeCenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderwoman Conley. Present. Alderman Donlin. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Alderman Hanauer. I'm here too. Mayor Langfelder. Here. Mr. Mayor, a quorum is present. Thank you. We do have uh, three presentations tonight. First one is uh, wow. with OBM. I don't know if Ramona Metzger wants to start it up or Director McCarty with our auditor. Good evening. I'm Ramona Metzger. I'm the comptroller. And with me tonight is Jamie Wilkie from Lauterbach and Eamon. Thank you. Good evening. Okay, we are working. I believe this evening you have a packet of information in front of you summarizing the audit results for the fiscal year. I know there's quite a bit to digest. There were a number of documents submitted to council as part of the annual audit process. Uh, my goal this evening will be to provide just a high level overview of the results of the audit and point out some of the key areas and sections within the document that you would wanna focus your time on. Uh, so for this evening, we do have the presentation of the February 28, 2022 annual audit for the city. Uh, four key areas I will cover this evening, uh, really the audit process and related documents. I do want to chat briefly about the city's financial award that was received as part of this year's audit process. The audit opinion itself, as well as our auditor required communications, and then certainly pointing out some of the key sections within what we call the annual comprehensive financial report or ACFR. Uh, that will be the primary focus this evening. It is the largest document that was submitted to council. Uh, it is the one with the logo on the front. So as we get into that section, if you have the PDF, up in front of you, I will provide some page number references this evening. Uh, so starting out with our audit process here with the city, Lauterbach and Eamon was engaged to provide audit services to the city. Uh, this was our first year engagement with city staff. I certainly want to start off this evening by thanking the team. There is a large team involved from various departments. Uh, this really is a team effort from start to finish, uh, really commenced in February. So at that time, we met with city, city staff. Uh, talk through requested materials for the audit, engaged in discussion on planning for the rest of the phases of the engagement, uh, and really use that as our kickoff meeting to the audit process. Uh, you'll see then in March and April, we undertook what we call preliminary fieldwork testing. Uh, the focus during that period of time is really gaining an understanding of the city operations, taking a look at internal control structures, reviewing policies and procedures, and really kind of starting the foundation for field work testing. Uh, you'll then see in late May, we began our actual testing of balances for the city. <coughs> Uh, our primary focus is starting with the utilities. They kind of roll up into other city operations, as you all are aware. So we really do focus first on that testing. Uh, and then we had drafts and final reports for the utilities issued in August and through September. Uh, and then shifted focus, obviously, to rolling those into the city's reports and finalizing the city documents over the last couple of months. Um, so just wanted to provide a high-level overview of our process. Uh, there were a number of documents, as I said, included in the email to you all regarding the audit. Uh, the focus tonight will be that very large PDF document, the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. Uh, but I did want to point out there were a number of other documents also included, and that would include, bless you, 
bless you. Bless you. No problem. Uh, separate reports for the cemetery fund, the local foreign fire, uh, water, and electric as well. Um, and there's a number of filings and things that go along with the audit process that we have been working with the internal team to wrap up um, over the last couple of weeks as well. As part of the audit process, we do have required communication letters that are issued to the city. Uh, the first important one is what we call our SAS 114 letter. Uh, the SAS 114 letter really outlines key areas related to the audit. For example, if we had disagreements with management, um, if there were significant adjusting journal entries that were detected from our testing. And I'm happy to report this evening that we really had no um, disclosures required in that letter. So so really the standard um, letter outlining that we had good cooperation with staff and no issues to report. Uh, we have also provided what we call our management letter. The management letter provides best practice recommendations as well as upcoming standards changes. Um, so nothing like an internal control finding or anything like that, but really some commentary back to staff to kind of improve things going forward. Uh, so that kind of rounds out the number of documents that were attached within the email related to the audit. I do want to point out, as I mentioned, the city earned a very prestigious award as part of last year's audit process, and you will find a copy of that award provided within this year's audit document. Uh, that is the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Uh, that award program is overseen by the Government Finance Officers Association, or GFOA. Uh, really, for any unit of local government, it is deemed the highest level financial reporting that any government entity can undertake. Uh, there are some additional disclosure requirements, sections within the document, which I will point out briefly this evening, uh, but certainly wanted to point out this prestigious award. Uh, as of this week, we have submitted this year's document to the award program, obviously anticipating receipt again of that award. Uh, the audit opinion itself will be seen on PDF pages 20 through 22 for any of you that have that document up in front of you. Uh, that really outlines management's responsibilities related to the audit as well as our responsibilities related to the audit. Uh, we have issued what we call an unmodified or clean audit opinion for February 28th, 2022 financial statements. Uh, that is the highest level opinion that we could issue to the city. As part of that process, I do want to point out that we did not audit the police or firefighter pension funds. Uh, those are, in fact, audited by their own independent firms. Um, but you will see we have referenced them within our opinion and certainly included their financial information within the city's document as well. As part of the audit process, we are required to take an overall look at the internal control structure for the city. Again, I indicated we had no findings that we would deem material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. Uh, so truly the cleanest audit opinion that the city could receive for the fiscal year. A couple of other key sections within the large PDF I do want to point out this evening. The transmittal letter is provided on pages 9 through 14 of that document. Uh, this is one of those required added sections for the award program, uh, really outlining some information about the local economy, uh, discussion of financial uh, policies and fin financial related matters, uh, discussion of really some of the key highlights from an operational standpoint during the fiscal year, as well as information on other city awards and acknowledgments. So I always think from council's perspective, this is a good section of the document to spend a little time in as well. And then lastly, the statistical section. This is at the very end of the audit document, PDF pages 224 through 255. Also a required additional section as part of the Certificate of Achievement Program always point this out to our councils and boards because there's a lot of 10-year trend information provided within this section of the document. So if you are curious, for example, what the financial results five and 10 years were, you'd be able to find that information at the back of the report, along with detailed disclosure related to the city's uh, revenue trends, long-term debt, 
operating indicators and economic and demographic information over the last 10 fiscal years as well. Uh, so really a wealth of information kind of condensed at the back of the report. The last section I want to point out that may be of council interest is what we call management's discussion and analysis or what we deem MDNA. Uh, that is provided on pages 23 through 35 of the large document again. Uh, this really does serve as the executive summary to the audit. Um, I, I joke that over time this thing just seems to get longer and longer with more disclosures and more disclosures. Um, it's hard to digest a document of that size, so this section of the report really does attempt to do that in a concise way. Uh, it will focus on major trends for the fiscal year, discussion on capital asset investments, as well as long-term debt activity. Um, so really, again, kind of condensed wealth of information within that section of the document. Um, always great from council's perspective to kind of get that executive summary oversight or overview of the audit results. Uh, certainly happy to answer any questions this evening as well as as they come up. I know there's quite a bit to digest and take in related to the audit documents that are required to be issued. Um, so certainly I've provided my contact information and would certainly welcome any questions that council might have either this evening now or in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, <coughs> questions or discussion? would like to thank Ramona Metzger and uh, Director McCarty and the OBM staff and uh, everybody that put in a lot of time and effort into this uh, process. I know it was a little longer than expected, but uh, we we're on different times, aren't we? Yes. And I think that wasn't out of the norm is what you had said previously. Yeah. Yeah. We're seeing that kind of across the board, especially for some of our larger communities. Um, yes. If you could expand on the, uh, just real quickly, uh, the challenges with the financial industry, especially with uh, personnel? Yes, we're seeing um, historic staff turnover, I'll be honest. Um, there's a number of open positions. Oh, there we go. There we go. Finally. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, number of open positions we're seeing really um, finance departments in general, especially our larger communities, kind of um, working with some slim staff in some cases. So. Um, and training curves, right? We have new people, new faces that require some of that investment time. So um, certainly we're seeing the impact of that um, with all of our municipal engagements. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate, us. <coughs> Appreciate you having us this evening. Mm -hmm. Next we'll have a chief. He has another engagement, so we'll ask him to come up and give a overview of the fire department. write a book I know I'm gonna try and keep it <laughs> short as I can that was what, why I was not here for the Pledge of Allegiance as I was still waiting for that to print it was probably <laughs> operator error um, but uh, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to come up and uh, give you as quick as, as possible of a uh, overview of what's happened with the, the Springfield Fire Department a lot of it, uh, obviously, is thanks to the votes of this body, and I appreciate everything that uh, everyone around here has given us the time and allowed us to uh, make great steps to modernize the fire department and to move us in the right direction. So I'm going to start off with the mission statement up there, which is that we're committed to providing the highest level of, pub of public safety services for our community, protect life, property, th through training and education in order to provide fire suppression, emergency medical services, and community risk reduction. Um, we are an all-hazards business. Um, I think that everyone that sits around this horseshoe understands that. Uh, we do a lot of different things when they don't know uh, what, who they need, what they need. A lot of times they send the fire department. So our people are well-trained. Uh, they, they hold to this mission statement. Uh, they believe in it, and they do a good job with it. Uh, we do provide class one protection to the city of Springfield and surrounding area. Um, what, that, what does that mean? It means that we are in the top 1% of fire departments in the country. There's only 411 fire departments in the United States that have a class one rating. Uh, there's over 40,000 uh, that uh, actually get rated by the ISO. 
Uh, they come in every four to six years generally. It's been about four years, so we expect them to come back soon. They look at our operations. They also look at uh, the uh, 911 center and they look at CWLP or the or, or two outside agencies that they look at as well. Both of those agencies do an outstanding job. Without CWLP, we don't have uh, the infrastructure that we need that when we have a large scale incident to make that large scale incident go away. So uh, we are very appreciative of all the work of all the people at CWLP and 911 to make sure that we are able to uh, keep that class one rating for uh, our folks here in Springfield. Um, they do account for our cruise apparatus uh, and equipment that we utilize. Obviously, uh, the apparatus that we just were allowed to purchase uh, this year is going to help keep that class one rating where it's at. Uh, we also do inspection programs. We have community risk reduction, which helps uh, keep that score where it needs to be. Um, we do a lot of training and education for our people. Our people are training all of the time. Uh, we try and it's going to be a point of emphasis over the next three to five years to send as many people as possible to, to some national uh, schools so that they're ready to take on that next step uh, when some of us are ready to step aside. Um, over the last three years, I picked this particular uh, time frame just because 2018 was pre-pandemic 2021 was we were starting to come out of it, so there should be some similarities in what we we're seeing out there in the field. Uh, that <coughs> top left number, which is the individual incidents, I get questions on this sometimes because our incident number tends to grow every year. And some people had asked, well, does that mean that if we send three fire trucks to one incident, that that's three incidents? And that's not the case. Um, one, every incident, uh, if it's a fire and we send seven pieces of equipment there, then it's still only one incident. It's not seven incidents. So that's not the reason uh, why our incident numbers keep going up. We expect to exceed 23,000 incidents this year. Um, a lot of those are EMS. Um, we are working on ways uh, to see if, if there's the ability to head off some of those. I spoke with all of the owners of all of the ambulance companies in town. Um, we've talked about uh, different types of uh, ways that possibly we could do some advertising. This is an emergency. This is not. Call 911 for this. Don't call 911 for that because, quite frankly, they're overwhelmed and we're getting close. So uh, total structure fires over that same period also went up almost 15 percent. Uh, historically, over the last 20, 25 years, we've stayed right at that 250 mark. Uh, we are not to the point where we're. Uh, a community where we're seeing a downtrend in the number of our, our structure fires. There are some communities that are there. We are not there yet. Um, wh when that'll happen, I don't know. But uh, we've been uh, right around 250 since at least the 80s. Uh, before that, we had more, but, uh, but now we're, that's where we've been kind of landing from year to year. Uh, total intentionally set fires over that same period, it doubled. Um, that's not great for our community. That's not great for our people. Uh, but that bottom number there, the arson arrests, that shows that our fire safety folks are really good at what they do. Uh, they actually tripled the number of arrests during that same time frame. They had more fires that they needed to arrest people for. But getting an arrest and an arson is actually a really hard thing to do because in, in a lot of situations, all of your evidence has been destroyed. Uh, so our people are really good at what they do as far as that goes. Um, and that was the reason for the uptick there. EMS responses also uh, an increase of 13%. We think that's going to continue to to happen. Total other responses were up 20%. Basically, total other is anything other than EMS and fire. So uh, when you have a hazmat or you have uh, some type of a, a you know a strange situation that they send us on, all of that falls under other. So uh, all all this time though during this time frame. Our, we actually had a decrease in our number of uh, duty-related injuries. So, and I, that is 100% a test to our people and their willingness to train and their willingness to keep themselves in the physical condition that they need to be in. So, uh, Chief, that's, are those, are the other incident, or would that be like uh, at, at uh, retirement villages where they've 
someone's fallen and you guys have to go, is that included in that or is that included in EMS? It depends on whether they get transported. It depends on whether it is what is considered an assist up or whether it is considered a medical call. Uh, those are coded generally by our 911 <laughs> folks that answer the phone. Um, but all of those are all included. Those have, those have dramatically risen. Obviously, we have an older population. We have a lot of areas in town, especially on the on the west side where uh, we have a lot of retirement villages uh, that require a lot of manpower. We, we go out there a lot, so. But those, some of the, 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 the simple answer is some of them do count, some of them don't, depending on what we do when we get there. If we just go there and we pick them up out of bed, they're not hurt. Sometimes it's not, it's not considered a medical call, but if they actually had a medi medical condition that caused <coughs> that fall, then sometimes it's, called, it's, it's counted as a medical call. Uh, accomplishments in the last 12 months. One of the one of the main ones, obviously, I have to give thanks to everyone sitting around here, where we were able to uh, make the historic apparatus purchase that uh, we're hoping that we're going to start receiving. Uh, our folks are going to go up tomorrow, actually, and look at one of the fire trucks that's being built right now. Um, but we know that that's going to make a major impact on our ability to uh, provide services to the people in the city coming forward. Um, we navigated an intense consultant study. Uh, they reviewed our operations, told us what we were good at, what we needed improvement on. Uh, I think that that was really good for our department in the city. Uh, sometimes when, when you're really close to a situation, you don't see your flaws, and I think that that w ended up being a really good thing for uh, our particular department because it told us things <coughs> from an outsider's perspective who also do the same line of work that we do. So uh, they picked out 32 things uh, that they think that we can improve upon, that, that we have a focus on. Uh, Alderman Redpath and uh, a few more other people in our community uh, sit on a, a, a task group that we work on getting towards uh, fixing all of those 32 things. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a year's thing, not a week's thing, um, but, but we're dedicated, we meet every month and we decide and we talk about uh, what things we should tackle first. Right now we're talking about EMS, so, um, excuse me. Uh, we just hired 21 uh, new recruits. Uh, some of them have come on shift. The way that when we hire, how it works is if you already have an advanced level of, of, of EMT um, licensure, uh, you can actually go on shift a little earlier than the people who need to go all the way through uh, our EMT training. Uh, so we had nine individuals in this class that came on shift. They actually started helping a week ago uh, towards our overtime costs. So we're happy that we were able to get them in place. We're looking at getting another class in place in February and then another class after that off of a new list that we're going to give the test uh, coming up here in January. Uh, what will that bring your manpower to? What will that bring manpower to? Right now it's 207. So we'll have, that'll be another, we'll be at 217. Uh, we like to be in the uh, 227 range is where, is where we're usually budgeted for. Um, we expect a large uh, number of folks to retire in the next uh, 24 to 36 months. So we're trying to stay ahead of it so that in the next you know, 12 months, 18 months, 36 months, we're not looking at this problem again. So, so Chief, why, why, why aren't we making back-to-back -back, uh, classes instead of having a break-in? Part of the problem with doing the back-to-back -back classes is that the people who teach in our academy are our own folks, and we're so understaffed right now that they're already working a lot of overtime, and to get them to do both is really hard. All right, that makes sense. Thank you. I was going to ask the same thing, and then the second question was, out of the next two classes, are you seeing some diversity? So we are. Uh, the class that's coming on in February, uh, we know that we have uh, two uh, women that are also people of color, which were, I know that that will make one particular individual <laughs> extremely happy, and it's not just me, uh, but yes, so, and then I think that there's, I think that we're going to have four uh, in the upcoming class. And then we won't know, you know, we're starting the recruitment uh, actually right now where is the big push for the upcoming test, which we're going to give at the beginning of January. So that's where I actually have to go after this. Why I have to get out of here is because I'm going to do some, uh, some speaking to the NAACP so that they can help us get good folks in the door so that we can get them hired. So um, 
We completed RFP uh, just a month ago uh, to get our paging, a new paging system in place. If you remember correctly, two or three years ago now it's been, uh, you gave us the money in our budget to do so. We saw that we were gonna try and build firehouses. It didn't make a lot of sense to me to try and do, uh, to install new paging systems in firehouses, then rip them out and put them in new firehouses. So what we've done is we gave that money back in hopes that you're gonna give it to us now to, to put it and we can start uh, in the, house, the existing houses and then about the time, hopefully timing wise, if things work correctly, that about the time that they're done in installing it in the existing houses, they'll be ready to, the, the new houses will be Steve, ready. Do you to fall under it. the Starcom system as far as your dispatch? We don't, it's kind of cost prohibitive for us. Um, I wanna say that- SPD's under that, correct? They are, and we could get on to their system, um, but for us, what we have in place with just the, uh, with the system that we have, it works fine, and we have what, uh, we have about a dozen radios that are Starcom ready, so if a tornado came through town and we needed to switch over to Starcom, all we have to do is actually turn the radio to that, to the Starcom channel and we can utilize it. And then we would just make sure that those those radios were positioned throughout the city Thank for you. the crews who needed them. <coughs> so um, we settled a four-year contract between the, the city and the union. Uh, we resumed our RTF training, which is our folks that would go in in an active shooter scenario. Uh, they work hand in hand with our law enforcement, whether it's city or county. Uh, we do uh, training with them on an annual basis as far as that goes. Uh, we picked back up, obviously, with community outreach, smoke detector, uh, recruitment, and fire explorer programs. And then we hired a, a new EMS coordinator, which is going to help us a lot as far as making sure that we get our EMS, uh, our EMS training where it needs to be. We've been able to do it over the last 10 years without one uh, as far as the training goes, but what we really needed was a QA, QI as far as doing those chart reviews, making sure that our people are doing things the right way, making sure that we're documenting everything the right way. Um, so I think that this is gonna be a huge plus uh, for us. And Tammy Carpenter is her name. She's been in the field for 32 years um, and she's well respected by all our folks. She's run a call with every single person on the fire department at some point. So they know her, they like her, and they really trust her. Uh, challenges and solutions. Some of the things that we know that we have coming up is, uh, is that we're gonna have to figure out a way with our EMS in town to, to get, make sure that the services that they provide, that we help them provide, um, that we're getting the, the people in town that are paying for services what they deserve. It's really hard, all of those ambulance companies, and, and I've, I've said this before, I've not thrown rocks at them by any stretch of the imagination. They do a great job, but they're having as hard, if not a harder time, getting and keeping good people. And in the emergency services business, it's really important. It's obviously high risk. You gotta have a lot of expertise and it's really hard work 24 hours. Um, you know, there's, there's some, some ambulance companies, I mean, they're running 20, 20 runs in a, in a 24 hour period. They're not getting a lot of rest. So uh, we're trying to work with them to formulate a plan so that we can make sure that they get where they need to be. We do what we can to help them out. We instituted a BLS transport uh, system uh, in coordination with everybody in the, in the area uh, about a year ago. We're still tweaking it, but it takes some of the pressure. The BLS can go to calls that don't require, it's not a heart attack, it's not a stroke, it's not something where they need some type of a higher level of care, that they just need an ambulance out there that can get them to the hospital a little easier. Uh, that takes a little bit of the pressure off of the higher end ALS stuff. Uh, we're, that's was put in place last year. We're still tinkering with that. We think that's gonna help. Um, one of the other uh, problems that we, well, I shouldn't say problem, it's just a challenge, is capturing some of the revenues that are out there. Um, we've talked about before about having the ability to collect uh, for some of the things that we do, uh, the mayor and uh, Director McCarty and I had conversation with a company in town that, that can do that on a broader scale, can collect for more things. Uh, we hope to have that in place right after the first of the year for the next couple of months. We're gonna be doing, I'm gonna be inundated with 
uh, recruiting and making sure that we get that done and the budget. So uh, after the first of the year, we hope to sign that contract and get them in place. They've made some some dollar dollar amount promises that I don't know if if they're attainable, but uh, they they think that they they said that they thought that they could possibly get four hundred thousand dollars in recovery for us. That sounds like a lot of money to me. Uh, a lot of that is based on uh, you know whether or not. We have the documentation that's that's sent in, but they take care of everything. They, that's that's after their cut. I would I would say that I'd be happy with a half of that, um, but that's what the uh, their their pitch was to us. So that that made us interested. So um, minority recruiting and hiring. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Continuity and budget equipment staffing addressing the overtime situation. Obviously, there isn't very many people in this room that are super thrilled about the amount of overtime that's having to go out the door right now, but it's just because we don't have enough people. Uh, I've done the projections all the way out to fiscal year 25, and by fiscal year 25, we're where we need to be as long as we continue to hire. The, the, the mainstay, the only thing that you can do uh, to make sure that that occurs is, is continuous and consistent hiring. So we're looking to do that. All of that, if we do it right, also helps uh, our minority numbers as far as how many candidates that we get and how many people that we can have on the fire department. You can't increase those numbers if you're not hiring. Uh, so as we hire, we, ex we expect that part to change as well. Um, salary compaction between staff positions and the line positions. Uh, my, my, uh, my staff folks, deputy division chief on up, um, there's not much difference between what they make and what a battalion chief on shift makes. That makes it difficult sometimes to, to ask that guy to give up that 2448 schedule and come up here and, and do some of the work that we work. Um, obviously, the stuff that we do is not nearly as, as enjoyable as some of the stuff that they do, not as exciting, not as rewarding on some levels, and they don't get yelled at. But, the, uh, the, but it's one of those things where if we had a little bit more of a, of a break in between battalion chief and the staff positions, that would help. Uh, get some more people be, to be interested in coming up and helping us. Um, and addressing the pension funding levels, that's not something that we really handle at our level, but we do realize that it's a challenge that you have to, at some point, make decisions between pension levels and some of the stuff that you can give us. Value and advantages of class one service. This is just, we're going to talk about really quickly about class one service and, and that it is something that... Uh, Obviously, it costs money for us to have the right equipment, the right people, the right places. Uh, so that's something, though, that uh, we do see uh, a benefit in the uh, commercial insurance, our, our companies around town, being able to attract new companies, knowing that they have a, have a class one uh, fire department helps a little bit. And then community pride always, you know, the mayor almost always every time that he talks about the fire department, first he says that the police department is his favorite fire department, and then he says that we have a class one fire department. So <laughs> there, is some, there is some civic pride in there. But. It is election year, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, special teams, all hazards. You know, we, we reported we sent people down to that, uh, that fatality uh, car wreck on I-55, and that's not in our district, but we were the only people that we that they had to call. So, and that our people are highly trained. Um, they were able to go down there and, and help them get that uh, into shape. Some of these smaller towns, they, they're relying on volunteers, um, and so our people are called out uh, through Mavis to to assist them on that. So, uh, but all that kicks in on our Class One service as well. Station and apparatus, we're doing everything we can with your help uh, to make sure that we have all of the infrastructure in place so that we can keep that class one. Outreach programs, recruiting, once again, it's, it's, it's like a broken record on some of this stuff, I know. But, uh, and then implementation of some study initiatives uh, that we're working on that we know that we can uh, put in place that will help not this class, but the next time that we have somebody through. Uh, that comes in to raid our fire department to make sure that we, you know, going forward, it's easier for, for our fire department to keep that. And that goes along with the long-term goals and planning. Technology, one of the things that uh, Alan Reine, who is, you know, my predecessor, uh, came in uh, and wanted to make us a more technologically uh, advanced fire department, and we made the joke that we're dragging fire department into the 90s whether we wanted to or not. 
Um, he did not throw the fax machines in the lake, but uh, we don't use them as much anymore. But we realize that technology helps us get places faster, more efficiently, more safely. Uh, the preemption system that, that we put in, uh, it's not just that we get there faster because, because you're talking about seconds, which seconds matter for us. But what it is, especially for the preemption uh, system that, that turns red lights green, is that it gets people out of the way. It gets people out of intersections. It, it doesn't have, you know, it, it makes us not be one of the, the fire departments on the national news, knock on wood, that has a fire truck that T-bones a car full of kids. Um, by implementing that preemption system, it makes the people that we serve safer. Um, so as much as we, we want to say it gets us there faster, it does get us there faster, but it gets us there safer too. Um, we're utilizing technology in uh, trying to diversify our, our workforce. We, we're talking with ISD about doing a better job as far as, as, far as uh, tracking all the people that we're trying to recruit to the city. Um, the chief? Yep. Um, I got to go ahead from the mayor, by the way. I did, it, did it appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, on the preemption, what, what, uh, what was done this year? What is going to be done by the end of the fiscal year with that? I just want an update on There's, that. We don't have anything in place for this year for preemption. We are going to put it on our, our wish list, as, as Director McCarty uh, it's a, uh, put it as far as the next part of the budget. Uh, it's about 150, and I say that, but... I haven't checked it in the last six months, which means it's probably double that. Where's the next area that's going to be attacked? So the next area that we had originally looked to do was the northwest corridor, but it's basically there's 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 four quadrants, and then there's then there's downtown. Um, downtown, we were kind of waiting on to find out they were going to do a study uh, again to to see if they could do some synchronization and, and what that would entail. So that was a left out. It was almost like a donut in the middle that we kind of left out on uh, downtown originally. Um, but it's about 150,000 per, per section. So uh, if we wanted to do them all, you're looking at about 600,000. Thank you. I just, I just appreciate the update. Yep. Uh, station placement, when we looked at where we were gonna put firehouses, we looked at runs, we used the GIS people for the, for the city of Springfield and they did a great job as far as showing where our runs are and making sure that we're putting firehouses in the middle of where we go. Um, and we, we utilize tech, tech for uh, efficiency over all of our disciplines. Uh, we're, we're using drones now and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit here with our special teams. No, that guy, I didn't put the picture in upside down, he's hanging upside down, he's a tech team guy, so. Uh, Hazmat, technical rescue, dive, and sonar teams are the teams that we currently have in place. Uh, we're working on drones, and we've actually used drones on some of our larger scale projects. Um, I think that that's going to be something that in the future we're going to use a lot more. We're going to be, be able to go, in, go into buildings, see where things are, um, and keep our people safe, find where some of the people that we serve may be at that, you know, we have lost kid calls. We have all sorts of things that we can use with drones. Oops. And uh, so we're looking at that. Our, our special teams folks, though, uh, they train on a, on a bi-monthly basis. That's by contract. And the reason we have to do that, and they're very good at what they do. Like I said, when there's nobody else to call around the, uh, the central part of the state, they call us. Uh, they know that we're, that we're good at what we do. But everything they do is, is what, what's considered high-risk, low-volume uh, type calls, which means that they're very dangerous and you don't do them very often which makes it even worse. So um, that's why we, there, there is a certain amount of the overtime money that, that uh, when I send out uh, my monthly thing to you that's, that says how much it costs for our uh, special teams to take care of what they do. But if we didn't get them trained the right way and you send them into some of these situations, these situations don't get better, they get worse. So uh, like I said before, all hazards, we go all sorts of places, and our people are creative, creative solvers. So, um, stations and apparatus, uh, stations six and eight are slated for replacement. Thirteen is to be added. Six will also include a community space now, uh, and it's going to also be able to be used as an alternate uh, EOC if there was ever an issue where we had another. Uh, you know, a tornado comes through and you can't get to can't get to downtown. We can set that up as an alternate EOC. So uh, that was something that we had a, a, a meeting about last week. Um, 
plans are going out to bid uh, this month, hopefully within the next couple weeks. Site prep uh, is, they're already figuring, uh, they're already talking to people about knocking trees down out for station 13 um, and getting site prep done, anything that they can get done while it's cold and hopefully it won't be too muddy. Um, the designs are for functional, modern, post-COVID spaces um, that can adapt as we have, if we have an, another pandemic come through. We've, we've built in spaces that we can use for uh, giving people shots or, you know, any of that type of lab work. Uh, we've built that into those, those facilities so that we have infrastructure that, uh, that we can help the community a lot, a lot better. Um, but it, the, the firehouses are not, uh, from the outside, they look like just a regular old firehouse, but we've, we've built things into them so that uh, they're able to uh, be adjustable depending on what the demand is for, for what's happening. Uh, our next step is to, we want to rebuild Station 2, which is the one out on Stevenson Drive that has the training tower behind it. That training tower is obsolete, can't be used anymore. It's not structurally sound. Uh, so we've talked to our foreign fire insurance board about it and then the mayor about uh, getting that designed with our own classroom, with our own training space. Right now we're, spending, we're sending groups to Decatur. We're sending groups to Champaign to, to train our people. And when we do that, we're still sending our people to train them there, but we have to use other facilities because we don't have anything in place. Do you have so, a timeline, a timeline on it? Well, after we get done, we're, they're finalizing all of the engineered parts of Station 6, which is 11th and Ash. As soon as they get done with that, I've been given the go-ahead by the mayor to go ahead and have them start with the design work for Station 2. And that'll have a classroom in it, and then we also want to have some props and some other things out there. They have, there's a lot of room behind that, that area out there. So, um, We've had comprehensive inspections done uh, on the existing stations. That was one of the things that uh, was in the consultant's report is that not only do we need to build some new facilities, but we need to look at the ones that we have because we need to find out, okay, is this one gonna need to be you know, redone soon because it's just in a dilapidated condition? Uh, luckily, that's not the case with, with ours, even though the, ad, the average of our firehouses is 54 and a half years old, um, which isn't, isn't very new um, and what we're what we ran into uh, on a couple of things is we can't fit certain trucks into some certain old houses uh, we made sure that on this new order that <coughs> everything that we ordered will fit in all of our fire stations uh, but we had a, a situation uh, chief zumo and i had a situation about 10 12 years ago where they brought a fire truck to us and it wouldn't fit into the firehouse so that's not really what you're looking for so uh, but we do but we do have a plan as far as what we need to rehab on all the existing stations a lot of them are, are still good good stations they're small by today's standards but our people make them work so um, the apparatus purchase uh, is going to bring our average age from 15.75 years down to 7.15 years old uh, so that's going to give us a lot of breathing room a lot of what Chief Zumo does every day is, is reshuffling the deck as far as where we're going to put our fire trucks that day because they have to have maintenance or something breaks on them or whatever. Uh, I, he's not going to know what to do with himself once we get these new fire trucks. So, yes, but he will. We'll, we'll figure something out. Um, but it will make a, a vast improvement to our fleet. Uh, you know, there's been a few situations every year where we run out of fire trucks and we and we put people in suburbans, and that's just not obviously where we need to be. But uh, the, the 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 new ones are coming, so that's a good thing. Um, and then the, few, the other things that we're we're looking at is the future EMS pathways. All of these stations that we uh, are have built or are getting ready to build. I'm sorry. Uh, have space in them so that if there was ever anything where we had to get into the EMS business that it's flexible enough to do that. We hope that that's not gonna be the case. We, we hope that uh, the, the way that we have it uh, working right now with, uh, with all of the ambulance companies that uh, they get their feet under them a little bit once the economy evens out a little bit, but it's really hard to find, for them to find good people right now. Outreach and community programs, uh, there's a lot of them. We have a lot of partnerships, uh, Red Cross, 
uh, is who we, we use our, uh, I, we do our CO detectors and our smoke detector program through. We've, we've done over 3,800 installs on those. Our Explorer post uh, does an outstanding job of taking young kids and, and teaching them what it's like to be a fireman. Uh, this year we, we, did, we had a stork pinning uh, with H HSHS. We had a, a crew that delivered, uh, delivered a baby out in the field with, uh, with Chatham. Uh, Chatham's had a crew there as well, uh, so they had a nice ceremony for us. Uh, Shields had the battle of the badges between us and, uh, and the uh, police department. I'm pretty sure they cheated, but, they, uh, but that was a nice thing to be out there right before school started, uh, as well as all of our, you know, our friends at Memorial Health, United Way, and MDA. Um, we donated a fire truck to CACC. This year, and we see that as a pathway to go from CACC to Lincoln Land to the SFD, keep all of those kids that are interested in doing that local, keeping them in town. Um, so that was one of the things that we were able to do uh, with some fire trucks that we just really couldn't use. Even though we can use fire trucks, we couldn't use these fire trucks anymore. So, and adopt a school is, is a recruiting tool, uh, a way for our people that they get in with the schools and they each each crew has their own school and they and that's who goes anytime that they have uh, you know any type of a, of a drill that that's the crew that goes to that school and takes care of that uh, we like that because it starts the mentoring process it starts uh, having some of these kids in these schools see the fire see the firemen come into these schools and say I can be like a you know, firefighters I should say firefighters and young ladies uh, can see our, our young ladies, especially when they come in there and say, I can do that. That's what I want to do. So uh, recruiting, uh, obviously, hot button topic. Uh, a lot of this, um, and I get questions on this all the time as far as um, what, are some of the, what are some of the difficulties with it. And the civil service process is a blind process. So once we get, once we get people to take a test and do well enough and then we do a background check on them, they pass that, and we, we send that to civil service, and they don't know who that person is, they don't know uh, what their demographics are, they don't know whether they went to college, they don't know any of that stuff. They just know they got a folder that has a background on them and that this is, this is a person that they have to vote thumbs up or thumbs down on whether they get on the fire department. I don't have a lot of say, quite frankly, and who gets on the fire department. So what, we try, what we're going to try and do is make sure that we put as many people as possible in the right position so that when they get that folder, it doesn't matter. What's in that folder is good enough for them to get hired for the fire department. So uh, we're partnering, partnering right now with, uh, with Robert, Robert Moore, uh, Frontiers, Goodwill, and AACP, other organizations, uh, to get us as many good candidates as we can. Uh, we're going to start uh, on this Saturday having our first open house at a fire station uh, where we're encouraging anybody who's interested in it to come and talk to us, have a hot dog, learn about what we do, and if you want to, we'll get you signed up to take the test. So uh, that's starting. We're going to do three of those at firehouses um, every two weeks, and then we're going to have uh, a, the last one at Salvation Army on December 19th. So December 19th, December yeah, December 19th. Uh, and then that'll be the last one that we'll have as an open house uh, where we can talk to people, get them excited about the fire department, uh, hopefully get them, get them signed up for the test. And then we'll, we'll also uh, we'll have some orientations uh, for people so that they understand what's on the test, how to take the test. This is what it looks like. Here's some things that you can practice online or, or find books where you, can, where you can practice some of the same uh, questions that you're going to be asked on that test. Uh, so we have those, we have two of those planned. I think they're on December 10th and December 15th. Um, so we, we want to set those up so that as many people as possible feel prepared to walk into that test. The test we're, that we have tentatively scheduled is for January 5th and January 7th. We're going to try and give it at three different times, uh, a morning and an afternoon on, on January 5th. And, uh, Saturday afternoon on uh, January 7th. So that will hopefully give people flexibility that they won't say, well, I can't get there at that time. we got three different options for you. Alderman to Conley. <coughs> I, I was just going to say, um, thank, I, I appreciate that you're doing some kind of um, 
I guess, pre preparation, offering that for, will you make sure that we get notices of that I so will. we can share that too? Yep. I'm, that's, that's a great idea. Yep. I'm, we're going to send that out um, as well as all of the uh, open houses, the times. They're always going to be from 1030 to 1230. Um, but I'll get you all of that. I'll get everything out to everybody. I'm going to be sending lots of texts, lots of emails, lots of uh, things on social media. And please share, share, share so everybody who's available to take it uh, can get it. Um, then, oh, and, yep. Uh, I'm sorry. And then do you have like just a brief summary of what the basic qualifications are to be on the fire department? Sure. You have to be 21 to take the test. Um, you have to have a high school diploma or a GED. Um, you have to have a fairly clean background. Uh, you have to be able to pass what's a CPAT, which is our physical agility test. And then uh, you'll have to be able to, to pass a psychological test as well. There's an there's a oral interview after, after the written portion of the interview, uh, but you can't be 30, 35 is as old as you can be to get hired. Or 21 to 35. 21 to 35. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Um, we're also trying to get in. We've had uh, we've had uh, meetings with District 186. We think that you have to have a long term goal and a short term goal as far as recruiting. And I think long term, one of the things, and, and I didn't make it up, but I like it, which is if you want shade tomorrow, you got to plant a tree today. Get in with these 12, 13 year old kids uh, and show them, hey. We want to mentor you. We want you to see this as an option uh, going forward. And that has to be something that we just do for, the, for going forward is that we want the reason why a lot of us, and I think everybody here knows that my dad was a firefighter. I didn't grow up, though, going, I'm going to be a firefighter. I just knew it was an option. And I, knew, I, I know that there's some kids out there that don't know it's an option. So I think the more we get in front of, uh, of, of kids in that, in that I don't know what I want to be yet, but I'm getting old enough to kind of figure it out uh, ages, I think that that is the, the strides where you can make it. It's not going to happen while I'm here. That's not going to be the benefit, you know, that's going to occur during my tenure, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen down the road as long as you're consistent with it. Um, we're open to new ideas. Uh, we're, we're trying to implement as many di uh, analytics as we can to working with ISD. But obviously, if anyone in this room has any ideas for us as far gr as groups that we can talk to, anybody that we can get in front of, uh, any type of recruiting, uh, we're open to. We, we've been doing stuff the same way for a really long time, and it hasn't gotten us where we want to be. So we're open to anything new, trying anything that we can to get in front of people. Consultant study implementation. Uh, I talked, touched on this a little bit. We, we've already uh, we've already gotten made some strides there. We've we've already done the apparatus station assessment, hired an EMS coordinator, and a couple other things. So uh, this will be a long term process. Uh, succession planning, I think, is essential for this, uh, and and so I think that that's one of the things that we're trying to build in. If we can uh, if we can send some people off to school to to get excited about. Uh, uh, being on the staff as well, then I think that, that puts us in a better place as well. Last slide, I swear. Uh, planning <laughs> and mapping out our success. Uh, that's my crystal ball up there. I don't know if you can tell. I don't think the mayor didn't like my crystal ball or anything inside of it. Uh, succession planning, obviously, I just talked about modern e EMS and transport I issues. Being ready for changes. We, we already have a plan if. Uh, there's a couple of instances in, in the United States where the, the EMS companies just said, we're done doing this, and they picked up stuff, they packed their stuff, and they went left town. We have stuff, we have a plan to be able to pick that up to a certain degree. The problem is, is that right now you can't get ambulances or anything. So, but we do have a plan if that were to be the case. You have to be ready for anything, I think. Uh, staying the course on, on apparatus replacement. Uh, Director McCarty made me promise that I wouldn't ask for any more fire trucks for seven years when you guys got this, and I'm, I'm going to hold to it. Um, but we still have to have that on our horizon, that, it, that we're still going to have to get more. Uh, recruit now for future success. Our I ISO scores, they're, they're going to be coming back at some prob time probably in the next year or so. Um, urban planning and being involved in the process for Springfield's future growth. 
I think that, you know, when we started talking about uh, the, the Shields area and that we're going to have a large scale athletic facility out there, we, we wanted to we want to be involved in making sure that, OK, how's a fire truck going to get in here when we need to? You know, we, where is a place? And I've talked to Director Dahl about this as far as trying to have an EMS center within there, because when you have that many people on a 94 degree day, somebody's going to get sick. So or somebody's going to get hurt. So, and that, that hopefully is not going to be the only place where we're going to see growth. So we would like to be a, a part of that uh, going forward to make sure that we're, we're also looking at ways that we can make sure that those cities, those areas are safe. Um, continuing the tread, trend towards modernization. This is, you know, the, the modernization, the, the, the 180 that we've been able to make uh, with everyone here's help over the last 18 months or so from going from, hey, I think we need to, to make cuts to, hey, we're able to push this and modernize and, and get, get more things that we need has been monumental. And it's been amazing for my staff and I and all the people who ride on fire trucks and from the bottom of our hearts, we, we thank you for that. Um, but we have more work to do. We are trying to be as, uh, fiscally conscious as we can and make sure that we're not asking for too much. I've been, I've been told ask for more, ask for more. Uh, but, and I appreciate that, but, uh, it's one of those things where we don't want to, we don't want to ask for too much. So, but I appreciate that, uh, revenue streams, staff light, salary, salary contractions, pension payments, all those things go into your jobs and we are conscious, conscious of that. And we know it's hard that sometimes you have to pick between certain things. Um, but that's all I have unless anybody else has any questions. Way longer than I thought. Good job. Any questions? I got one. Alderman Hanauer. Thank you. On the, um, Bless you. So we passed the ordinance on the uh, billing people on, that don't live in the city. And to date, we haven't, we haven't gotten anything from we've, that. We've collected a little bit, but we have not collected very much. There's, quite frankly, there, it's one of those things where for us to acquire all of the information necessary to bill an insurance company. It's kind of difficult. It's not what we're built for. Uh, we, we, have, we have done some collecting, but that's why we, we knew that it wasn't working. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a very efficient process, and we knew that there was the ability to do so. That's why uh, when we, we talked to, I think it's called USA Revenue Recovery, uh, when we talked to them, they said that they could get us some results. They'd so, be able to go back, retroact, go back before. I think that they can do so to some extent. Um, I don't know how much, but I don't think that there are, I don't think we're missing out on hundreds of thousands of dollars I, on, on what we were going to bill for anyway, because mostly what we were going to bill for were, were, were uh, wrecks and hazmat incidents. So if we had to send somebody out there and do uh, some damming of some areas to keep, uh, any type of chemicals or diesel fuel or something from le leaking into uh, a water source. Um, that's expensive to do for manpower and stuff. But then you still have to find out, well, who am I billing with this? And that's pretty labor intensive. And I got one person who can do it. So, and she does everything else too, as far as from our, so that part of it was kind of difficult to do. We, we, we were not super successful, but that's why we wanted to find another way so that we could be successful. Well, because my that. concern on that, this is we, we, I can't remember how long ago we, we passed that. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, we can pass all the revenue stuff we can, but if you guys can't get the data right. and you guys can't implement it, right. it does us no good. Right. I and, agree with you. And I, I mean, um, so we, we've got to, you know, we work with you guys to, to, to do that, and I'm a little disappointed that we weren't able to act accordingly to, to you know, get it done. But I'm glad that we're looking at another option. That's why, that's why we looked at another um, option, because we, we knew that we weren't getting what – we were, what we were getting was not worth the amount of hoops that we were jumping through, because then we had to – a lot of times, like for, from the fire services side, there, we don't need people's – uh, license plates and driver's license numbers and all sorts of other things. So, so on some of these on some of these incidents where we were we were going to be billable, then we were asking our people to go and do things that they don't usually do. That you know that, that acquire certain information that they don't usually get 
I'm not saying that can't be done, that they, that they need to get in the habit of doing so. Well, I would think you could get it through the, our police office. You can, you can, and then, but then it, generally it would be somebody else that's going to try it. Yeah. I agree with you, it can be done. I think that this company, though, has tools in place, whether it's, uh, whether it's software or whatever, that helps jog. Our, these are the things that we need to do. We'll have training on it. That is one of the things we definitely will do is we will have training on our people. Hey, these are the five things that you need to get so that we can get reimbursed on this stuff because it is it is enough money to worry about if they're talking about something in the six figure range. But we were getting a few thousand dollars a year, maybe you know, and it was one of those things. And I think that I've, we didn't do we could have done better. That we that I will fall on the sword on that. We could have done better on that. Thank you, Alderman McMinimum. Chief, uh, you mentioned the uh, fire uh, training tower behind Station 2 on Stevenson Drive and how it's obsolete. It mm -hmm. can no longer be used for training purposes. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on using the uh, Foreign Insurance Fire Fund to uh, take, that, take care of that because that's a, uh, a, a funding commitment that would otherwise come out of our corporate spending right. fund. So. They, they do a fantastic job. In fact, next year uh, we have a, a new boat on order on, for all of our water rescues uh, that, they, that they're paying for. We had to, we had to chip in. We had, we had to pay for the, the dock. We had to pay for the dock. They paid for the seventy or $80,000 uh, emergency boat, and we have to pay for the dock. So uh, that was a pretty good trade-off. They've... They're also getting a new UTV that we can use when we're out at the fairgrounds or when we have something downtown and we need our people to, to do EMS or something like that. They're paying for that. That is a also an expensive piece. It's way more than I thought it would be um, to have uh, one you. of those that's that's stocked for, for EMS. So. You serve on that foreign insurance board? I do. Thank you. So that you provide good uh, leadership and uh, spending priorities. I, I will pass that along to everyone. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Chief. Thanks, Chief. Before our next uh, presentation, I'd like to take uh, agenda my item number 2022-440 uh, out of order. So uh, they have travel Second. engagements to uh, get to. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. And second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Uh, item agenda number 2022-440 in your ordinance authorizing the amount of $2,200,000 for the demolition demolition of some of the buildings, converting some buildings, rehabilitating other buildings, and road infrastructure improvements to related Midwest LLC, utilizing Far East tax increment finance funds for the popular place redevelopment project for the Office of Planning and Economic Development. Chair will entertain a motion. Place agenda number 2022-440 on final passage. So I'll move. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? Sorry, Mayor. Alderman McConley. I, uh, I just, I don't have the right screen just for the clerk. Um, I've got Stanford Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Alderman Redpath. So I understand that you uh, met with labor and uh, you guys have come up with an agreement for the PLA and uh, everything else is all good right we did we came up with an agreement um, we feel strongly about it it's an unprecedented agreement it agrees with a 30% uh, minority participation amongst the workforce so we're really happy with it um, and we're pleased to, to work with them perfect thank you thank you you all go older woman are you all good Alderman Gregory does it no, I, I would just like to say, no, I, I, you know, I appreciate you guys, um, you know, really getting to this point so we can have all the information together um, um, so we can really pass this. It's important to our community, and I know it's important to, to Alderman Williams to have a high minority percentage, um, and, you know, this, this will, you know, hopefully uh, uh, start the pathway to some other things that we want to see in our city. So I appreciate you guys for, for kicking us off and working with us and, you know, going through this time. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for your partnership. Any other discussion? Yeah. Alderman Hanauer? Um, we have, I guess, an amendment, but I don't see the amendment in our packet. It's it over just here. listed on the, on the sheet, oh. but I don't see the actual amendment. Well, the actual ordinance isn't in our agenda, isn't in our, on our agenda. A little strange. Is there an amendment 
corporation council, or do we have there, to amend it there's to There's not an amendment for 440. It's there listed is. here as 440 on first reading and as an amendment, amendment, but it's not actually in our packet. Well, actually, then, that's actually, it should say 435. That's actually relating to the um, land, bank. land bank. So that, that's a, that's a right. typo on our part. This is um, the 2022-440 the, the is approving the development agreement. Um, that had been provided about a week ago. Then there was some refinement done yesterday that was circulated. And then this afternoon we had circulated the signed PLA that kind of ties back to the development agreement. So there is no amendment. So there is There's not an amendment, amendment for 440, and that's, uh, that's, uh, my, okay. that's my mistake. Okay. It actually relates to, if you, look at, if you look at the very next page, it actually relates to the 435. So my right. apologies on that. Got it. Do we need to pass 435 and 440 at the same time there? No. no Two separate. different things. Okay. Four, nope. 440 relates to Poplar. the Poplar Redevelopment Agreement, and it does tie together all of the questions, if you recall, from the committee meeting. Uh, we do have the updated language, just clarifying. It doesn't change any of the financial, but it was clarifying kind of the workflow and all scope of work, so that was that's resolved. And then the issue with the... Uh, uh, PLA is resolved, and that was all circulated today. Perfect. That, that is my understanding of the current status. Get it on there. Correct. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the ordinance, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. Okay. And the ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank we you. look forward to working with you all. Thank, hey, thank you. For your hey, thanks thank for your you. diligence on this. I, 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 I talked to you later after the meeting last week. It's, it's thank you. Good job. Appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Mr. Mayor, can we move uh, 2022-468 to the agenda for consideration? I'll move. Second. Been moved and seconded to move. Uh, what number was that again? 2022-468. Okay. I move and, for passage. Move and second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next time on the agenda is 2022-468, ordinance vacating a portion of Dodge Street between Rutledge Street and First Street in Springfield, Illinois, to Memorial Health System. Chair will entertain a motion to place or to hold a public hearing regarding the vacation of the property. So moved. Second. Okay. We move and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Public hearing is now open. Does anybody wish to address the city council regarding this vacation of property? Motion Chair, to adjourn. Second. second. We move and second to adjourn the public hearing and reconvene the regular city council meeting. Second. Discussion? So All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-468 on final passage. So second. second. We move and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. This time, uh, the chair will entertain uh, Director Dahl uh, with regards to the presentation of the Route 66 <coughs> master plan. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Um, I want to welcome Jim Bocoltz and Michael Gross from Schmeekley Reserve. Uh, they came all the way down from Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Yeah, and so if you don't know where Stevens Point is at, it's just north of Madison. They're actually part of the University of, of uh, Wisconsin. It's the similar longitude to Green Bay and Minneapolis. Um, I think with the way the NFL football season is going, you probably are leaning more towards Minneapolis, but that's just one person's opinion anyway. I'm sure he appreciates that. Packer joke, right? But no, in all seriousness, we appreciate you being here today. Before I turn over the uh, presentation to Schmeekly, um, uh, just a brief background on this. We engaged Schmeekly Reserve in 2020 to do a Route 66 interpretive <coughs> master plan addendum to the 2008 State of Illinois interpretive master plan uh, that by chance, Speakley actually created. So um, we thought, well, to engage them uh, to create a Springfield area master plan, because we, you know where we're going with Route 66. Uh, we've been working on this uh, since 2018 and moving this forward. Well, we know what happened in 2020, 
So uh, we re-engaged them in 2021, and over that time, they have met with stakeholders. We had a public Zoom meeting. We had a stakeholder meeting. Um, they've, they, made, they had a visit to Springfield and spent a couple days reacquainting themselves with the Route 66 assets. Uh, and so really, this, that's a culmination of their year's worth of work. Uh, and they have this draft plan that we're uh, looking forward to making public very soon. And we wanted to give that presentation to the city council tonight. So without further ado, Jim Bocholtz. Thank you, Scott. Thank you all for inviting us to speak to you tonight. Uh, again, my name is Jim Bucholtz. I'm the director of Schmeekley Reserve, which is on the campus of the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. We also have Dr. Michael Gross here with us tonight, who is a uh, retired uh, faculty member with our College of Natural Resources. And we specialize in interpretive master planning. So essentially, that's helping agencies and organizations to tell the story of their unique resources in a way that's meaningful to visitors. With the idea is that visitors who have a meaningful experience will spend more time with those resources and will also invite their friends to come and see those resources as well. Um, so as uh, Scott had just mentioned, we were hired in 2008 to do the interpretive master plan for the entire uh, Route 66 corridor through Illinois. We were then hired back in subsequent years to help actually develop some of the concepts that were in that master plan to actually create some interpretive media that probably looks pretty familiar to you along the road. We were hired back in 2011, 2012, and 2014 to develop some of this media. And with the upcoming Route 66 Centennial, just four short years away, um, Scott had invited us to come back and really take a closer look at the Springfield area and some of those resources and what could be done to tell those stories in new and exciting ways. So shortly, uh, you will be given the digital draft of the uh, Springfield area addendum for the interpretive master plan. Obviously, we don't have a lot of time tonight, but I do encourage you once it comes to read through it um, thoroughly. Uh, there's a lot of good information in there. Just some quick highlights, though, tonight. Um, two big things to kind of keep in mind. First of all, planning is a collaborative process. So what you see with these recommendations aren't just coming from Mike and myself uh, up in Wisconsin. Uh, it really is from the stakeholders we met with, uh, city and county and state officials, business leaders, um, property owners, community members that just have a passion for Route 66. This is really the synthesis of all those different ideas coming together into a plan. The second major thing that really came out of our planning process is that Springfield has great potential for enhanced Route 66 tourism. Uh, a tremendous amount of Route 66 resources that are here, yet most international tour groups that are coming through the Springfield area spend just a fraction of a day here, primarily going to the Abraham Lincoln uh, tourism attractions instead of the Route 66 attractions. With enhancements, with interpretation, we can provide those meaningful experiences that will keep people in town even longer to experience what Route 66 is all about. So here are some quick priorities that we came up with. Of course, a lot more detail in the plan itself. The first thing is to improve wayfinding. Mike and I have been uh, through Illinois quite a bit on Route 66, and we still get lost driving through Springfield trying to find Route 66. <laughs> and a lot of that has to do with the amount of times that Route 66 has changed routes over the years. Many different roads are associated with Route 66. It's almost a spider web and very challenging for a general traveler to find where they're supposed to go. So one of the main recommendations is looking at clearly defining three main alignments through the city. The primary one going from Peoria Road to 6th, uh, 9th Street to 6th Street with the 1926-1930 route heading off to the west and the 1940 to 1977 bypass on the east. How do we define those corridors? Well, of course, obvious direction signage is the first step. So working with the scenic byway program um, to develop and make sure that the correct signs are up that identify each one of those alignments, making sure there's enough direction signs. When you're in a busy urban area like Springfield, you need more signs so people feel reassured that they're on the correct alignment. Secondly, is to develop some Route 66 attraction signs. There's already attraction signs to many of the Abraham Lincoln sites. By putting these Route 66 attraction signs out, you elevate those attractions to the same level as, as uh, some of the other attractions in town that tourists are already coming to see. 
But wayfinding is more than just signage. It's also looking at the physical landscape that people are driving on. So really thinking about streetscaping and corridor enhancements. In 2013, the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission developed a real interesting um, concept for redeveloping Peoria Road with pedestrian walkways and vegetation. But you can also see a lot of Route 66 elements incorporated into it. We know there's currently an RFP for this corridor development, and hopefully Route 66 is a part of that redevelopment of the corridor, but that's also expensive. And there's some less expensive ways to really identify those corridors easily at this point. Uh, one of those would be you know, putting up street pole banners, or painting the roads with Route 66 emblems, or putting uh, benches in with Route 66 emblems, or uh, wraps for utility boxes. A lot of different ways to bring people and reassure them that, yeah, I'm on Route 66 right now. There's some bigger concepts as well, artwork that could be used, like the uh, railroad underpass concept. This was created by the sign company in 2017. There are already murals that high school students painted underneath that underpass that represent Route 66. Interpretive murals are a fantastic way to help tell a big story quickly as you're driving in your car um, without very many words at all. Um, there's some murals that are already planned, like this one for the transportation center that does have the Route 66 emblem in the front. But there's a lot of other buildings along the Route 66 alignments that have some bare walls or some brick walls that might be ideal places to do some type of mural that represents what that area was like during the heyday of Route 66, all in an effort to enhance those different corridors. Route 66 was once known as the Neon Corridor because of all the businesses that had their neon signs out. One of the recommendations is developing an incentive program for businesses where they can restore their neon signs that they may have had if they have a historical association or even developing new signs that represent the Route 66 A Day as well. Um, obviously, Springfield is very, uh, has an advantage in that they have the A Sign Company that's been doing this kind of thing since 1940. A second big recommendation that you'll see in the plan is to enhance existing core interpretive sites. Those are places that travelers are already going to that tell the story of Route 66 in different ways. By investing in those core interpretive sites that are already existing, you get a big bang for the buck because people are already going there. You can help to enhance those meaningful experiences. For example, Motorhead's Bar, Grill, and Museum, an incredible treasure trove of artifacts. The best way to see it, of course, is with a tour with Ron Metzger but not everybody will have that opportunity. So by putting in some interpretation, like an experience hub, to tell them the significance of Route 66 and some of the other regional attractions that people can visit, or by looking at some interpretive wayside exhibits that explain the significance of certain artifacts, like the uh, seal fountain from the Bel Air uh, Motel, provides some of those meaningful experiences for people. Another uh, core interpretive site, the Cozy Dog Drive-In. Who doesn't stop at the Cozy Dog for a hot dog on a stick? Um, already people are stopping here. Again, wayside exhibits can help tell the story of that site, but also providing some photo opportunities along the way at these interpretive sites so people can share it on their social media. The Root History Museum, a more recent core interpretive site telling a totally different perspective of Route 66. Um, that experience of black people who lived and worked and traveled Route 66 throughout the eras. Fascinating museum. Um, Root History Museum is currently working on an app called the Root History Metaverse Experience, which will take an augmented and virtual reality and help bring some of these sites to life. There's a lot of other apps and those kinds of things that could be developed for different topics uh, for Route 66. The Mayhans Filling Station next to Fulgenzi's uh, Pizza and Pasta, already a fantastic photo opportunity for people by incorporating some interpretation, like maybe a life-size statue of a filling station attendant, a wayside exhibit talking about the significance of the site moving from place to place, and possibly even creating another passport program as kind of a scavenger hunt looking for different colored Route 66 symbols, similar to the Abe's hat hunt that's currently in place um, from the CVB. Uh, Mayhans would obviously be a part of that passport experience. The A Sign Company Sign Museum, again, uh, creating signs since 1940 along Route 66. Fantastic way to get a tour through the sign shop itself, but if tourists are there on a time when the museum isn't open, there's really not much to see. We have to be uh, ready for those kinds of situations as well. Having an exterior uh, wayside exhibit that talks about the significance of the sign shop, and maybe you'll press a button and hear about Joe or Dennis Bringett and with their experiences of creating signs during the Route 66 era would be kind of a neat opportunity. 
Springfield Visitor Center, not necessarily an interpretive hub, but obviously a place where people are going to go for information. We've recommended the development of an interactive touchscreen computer system to help people fly over the route and experience what some of those attractions are like, and then do some planning as well. Third major recommendation is to develop new core interpretive sites. Some of those, as you know, are already underway. We had a chance earlier today to see the new developments at the Route 66 experience at the fairgrounds. Just incredible things that are happening there. Uh, definitely will be a statewide attraction for everyone. Happens to be in the city of Springfield, which is fantastic. Um, interpreting Route 66 from Chicago to the Chain of Rocks Bridge with their Legends Neon Park, which has already been started. And who could avoid sliding down 66 on that big slide, right? <laughs> really cool things. But there's some maybe um, more subtle sites that could also be developed into core interpretive sites. In Carpenter Park, visitors have the opportunity to walk on the original pavement of Route 66 from 1926 to 1936 in pretty much the same form as it was during the Route 66 era. Even with curbing, it kind of slides downhill toward this beautiful Sangamon River. We'd recommend creating that into an interpretive trail. We're recommending upright orientation exhibits that command attention but are less exper uh, expensive than the experience hubs, along with some unique trail side exhibits that tell the story of that road. It would end at an overlook over the Sangamon River, right where the old iron bridge once crossed. And that's what Route 66 crossed over in the, in, uh, the old days uh, before it changed directions. Shays Gas Station, the former Shays Gas Station uh, <laughs> Museum, once an iconic site along Route 66, but you know, sadly after uh, Bill Shea passed away and a lot of his artifacts were auctioned off, um, today it's not the attraction that it used to be. But there's a real possibility, Randy Pickett is the current owner, um, he's very interested in potentially making this into a tourist stop again. There's already groups that kind of stop there and look through the chain link fence because they know that it's an iconic area. By doing some interpretation, we could bring some, back some of that magic. Of course, without Bill Shea, it's a lot different, but perhaps a full-size cutout of Bill Shea with a wayside exhibit that explains the significance of his museum and artifacts. Uh, perhaps a video that's embedded into an old fuel pump with Bill Shea being interviewed would be some ideal things to work with. And the Lincoln Home National Historic Site, not something we usually associate with Route 66, but when you think about it, Route 66 was the road that brought all the tourists into Springfield to visit these different Lincoln sites. And in the 1970s, there was this information center on the Lincoln Home National Historic Site right next to 9th Street, which was Business 66 at the time, that brought people in and told them about the different attractions in the area. Today, that is used as a storage shed, but the National Park Service is very interested in creating some type of exhibit within this building that could talk about the tourism and the importance of Route 66 for tourism and connect with a whole different audience that maybe doesn't have any connection to Route 66 currently because they're just going to the Lincoln sites instead. So some neat opportunities. <laughs> A fourth major recommendation, and this connects back to these development of core interpretive sites, maybe not something um, that you could do prior to the centennial because it'll take quite a bit more planning and more funding, but we do feel that it's important to have a flagship experience for people that are traveling Route 66 in Illinois. Um, the Route 66 experience at the fairgrounds is kind of the foundation of that statewide experience, but we also feel that it's important to consider having an enclosed space as well with people who can welcome travelers, who can provide stories for those travelers, and who can, uh, where we can put some exhibits that wouldn't work typically outside as well. In the original plan, we had the Bel Air Motel as an idea for this discovery center. Obviously, that doesn't work anymore. Um, but some of the exhibits that you might have would be a little boy or girl talking about their experience uh, driving to Disneyland on Route 66, perhaps a crashed car to talk about Bloody 66 and the accidents that occurred when people drove too fast around the curves and how that uh, led to increased engineering of roads or a high-speed, fast-paced theater experience with different objects and videos and music that would bring the Route 66 story to life in a very concise way. So the Bel Air really isn't an option anymore, of course, but there are some other options, and, and this isn't set in stone, of course, but these are some potentials that we've included in the plan. The Hobbies, Arts, and Crafts Building at the Illinois State Fairgrounds is directly associated with the outdoor exhibits for the Route 66 experience. That might be a possibility um, for a Discovery Center. There's a gas station property just south of the Lincoln Home a National Historic Site. 
um, that could potentially be used as a Discovery Center site as well. Or looking back again at the Shays Gas Station Museum, if Randy Pickett was interested, this could be another site that already has some iconic status already. So that was a very quick overview of some quick suggestions and recommendations. Um, obviously, there's a lot more in the plan, and we encourage you to read through that uh, when you get it. But it's been a really exciting project to be able to work on, to be able to meet with all the different stakeholders and everybody who's passionate about Route 66. And we definitely look forward to seeing what happens in the next few years as Springfield moves towards that Route 66 centennial. With that, I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank well, you. You have great energy. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah, I wish you could uh, train our chief on that, too. <laughs> Alvin Donlin. Yeah, I echo those comments. Man, that's a lot of energy, and we appreciate that. And, oh, and sure. uh, you know, your ability to fly through a presentation much faster than chief is also <laughs> Appreciate it. Can we get him to do a uh, training oh. on, on presentations? All the presentations. All oh. the presentations. He, he's, not, he's not here, so I, what I wanted to say earlier was, Chief, you know, you've given your budget presentation. Now it only, should only be uh, five minutes in uh, this January. But anyway, I, I appreciate your comments. I had the opportunity last August, I mean, August of 2021, to drive from our fair city all the way to Santa Monica, oh, wow. California, awesome. on Route 66. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, we're moving a family member out there, and it was, uh, quite frankly, kind of disappointing. Uh, I expected more, uh, more interpretive type exhibits. And, and really, what, what I wanted to ask is, and I, I love what you've done. This is, this is awesome. I think it's spot on. Let's just cut to the end here. Yeah. And uh, if we can get these things done, this is going to be extremely powerful for this community and bringing people in. Yes. So in your experience, obviously, you spent a lot of time and, and uh, studying Route 66. What areas are the best now for this, for this type of activity? Or are, are any up to par? For interpretation yeah. along the entire route? Yeah, kind of like, what, like what, what's the best place for tours to get the experience presently? Boy, that's a great question. And I'm not as familiar with the rest of the route because we were only hired to work in the Illinois area itself. Um, but, you know, in some areas in New Mexico have some pretty strong areas in Oklahoma. Um, there's a lot of presence right now, I believe, in Oklahoma. They're developing a, a Route 66 visitor center, a really comprehensive okay. visitor center. So it sounds like we could be really ahead of the, ahead of the curve. And, oh, know, I think so, yeah. I, I was disappointed in particular in Flagstaff. Flagstaff was neat. Uh, they, had a, they had a section of the old Route 66, yeah. uh, but the signs were old, and it was just not what I expected. Sure. And then the area like where Peach Springs is located and they based the movie Cars on, mm -hmm. that was a big disappointment. But uh, it was cool to be able to do it. Uh, I told my son before we went that this is a trip of a lifetime and we will not do it again, and we've done it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, thanks, thanks for your uh, energy and uh, anything we can do to help, I'm sure uh, you, you got it. So this is, this is great stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Other woman, Desenzo. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Donlin, I've made that trip four times. Oh my. Wow. Three of them solo. <laughs> um, but I also serve on the, Bi or the Centennial Commission with Scott Dahl, and you're just kind of showing off at this point. But it's good stuff, and we have a lot of plans, and it's a good group, and we're getting ready to meet here pretty quickly again. So um, Excellent. I'm sure Scott will be showcasing these ideas. Great. Thank you. Great. Anything else? Any other questions or discussion? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate you, you being you here much. and giving the overview. Thank you all. Have a good night. And again, I think the link was emailed to everybody, right, Scott? Yes. Yeah, it was. Yep. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the October 18, 2022 second. City Council meeting and approve the minutes. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council first reading of ordinances in the record of the city council. Come on, move. Second. The move and second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council reading of the consent agenda into the record of this city council. Come on, move. Second. second. The move and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to place the consent agenda on final passage. Come on, move. Second. Good move and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the consent agenda vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. Clerk, I'm going to be a present on 453, please. Noted. And the consent agenda passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. I want to move present on the liquor and gaming. Okay. With the two exceptions being noted. 
Agenda number 2022 2256-2022-384-2022-455-2022-456-2022-458-2022-463 remain table learning committee. Is there any uh, motions on any of those? Yes. Mayor, I move to bring the agenda item 2022-435 out of committee for discussion. Second. Moved and seconded to bring 2022-435 out for discussion and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. 2022-435, an ordinance amending the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended by adding Chapter 32, Section 32.56.1 through 32.56.7, and by amending Chapter 33, Section 33.802, pertaining to a land bank. Is there a motion? Oh, is there a discussion on the ordinance? There's an amendment, correct, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Is there a motion to amend? So moved. Alderman Gregory? Yes. Moved and seconded. Uh, and two discussion, seconds. if you'd like to go over that, uh, Corporation Council. Certainly. The um, I think the 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 uh, entire uh, ordinance was discussed to some length. The amendment, uh, which we inadvertently mislabeled earlier, and I apologize for that again, was simply adding the uh, thirty-two fifty-six point eight, which I do have highlighted in there just for your your convenience it's on the uh, inside of what we had passed out and what that does is simply um, add language uh, it indicates that the proceeds for any sales of properties through the land bank process would be uh, set aside by office of budget and management to be used for rehabilitation of distressed properties so trying to set out at least that uh, that process that any of the activities, uh, and I think that was one of the questions, Mayor, that came up, I think, in the committee is what happened with resources if there were uh, properties that were sold. So the amendment is simply adding that section, uh, which would say any proceeds from sales would be set aside to uh, be used for rehabilitation purposes. Mm -hmm. Discussion on the amendment? Although Woman Conley. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Circle, how do you define distressed properties? Um, is that it somewhere is, else in the code? Uh, we do not have a, uh, a definition in this section, but uh, it would be those properties uh, that we would deem to be distressed based on building code violations. Um, that's similar language that we've used in other parts of the city code. You know, distressed properties meaning uh, uh, giving its normal uh, meaning would be relating to building code violations. Now. One of the things that if you think that, uh, just throwing this out here, we could certainly add language uh, that would say for rehabilitation of distressed properties um, that are uh, <coughs> subject to building code violations. In other words, it's, it's tying it back to what the property, what the money would be used for. I mean, I think, because I, 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 it's, it's not a term that I think we have, a, at least I wouldn't have a clear comprehension or be able to explain to someone what is a distressed property. If we could maybe have a definition included in the definition sections that's specific to the land bank, I would appreciate that. And, um, you know, and, and I'm assuming these are just, <clears throat> sorry, uh, distressed properties are, are, home, are owned by the person who lives in them, or are we talking about rental properties or maybe rehabilitating properties that the, the city owns? How does that... I don't think it would be limited to just properties the city owns. Um, I think that this is setting it aside for when the appropriation happens, because remember what happens with this is it just goes into an account that would have to be then appropriated, meaning it goes through the appropriation process where you would determine then how it would be spent, because you might, uh, the council, the, uh, as it's done with some other programs, uh, designate it just for home ownership, or maybe it's for those that are six-pointed, you know, those where there's demolition is appropriate. So this is just setting where the funds go, but there would have to be further action before it could be spent. And I, I think I think this is a good idea, and it kind of keeps, you know, gives 
one of the weaknesses, which was you know that, that ongoing revenue source. Um, I, I would just like a little more clarity around what distressed properties means. If we are we going to use that to prioritize properties that would otherwise go to a tax sale and, and, and use them to purchase, just some, a little bit more clarification on, on what that term is. Well, and uh, I think we could add language that says rehabilitation of distressed properties. So if we, if it's the pleasure of the council, we could further add language that would say uh, uh, basically relating it to uh, to promote home ownership or to promote a certain thing, distressed properties, you know, rehabilitation of distressed properties to, pr you know, promote home ownership or repair of owner occupied or see what I'm saying? Yeah, maybe but ordinarily, some options for what that actually means. I mean, and I think those are good. Those are two, two areas that I think this, this program is intending to do, but I, I'm just, I'll just leave that. I, I don't think there's there's a whole lot of, I mean, if, if all of the funds, and I, I realize it's not going to be a ton of money, possibly, but it could be, and I just would like to see some sort of structure around, just what does that term mean? I don't know what that. And ordinarily what you would end up doing is during the appropriation process, there would be an ordinance that would spend the money. So what I mean, there would be a follow-on ordinance. This is just setting it aside in an account. Therefore, afterwards, there would be a follow-on that would say how it was spent. Okay. If that makes sense. No, it, it, it does make sense. I'm just saying that I don't think that there's a lot of detail on what okay. distressed means. Yeah, originally when we uh, structured this, we thought it'd be uh, for those that were on the demo list and uh, move that direction. But in uh, further discussions, uh, we thought it might be better for flexibility. So uh, again, as Corporation Council alluded to, it'd have to come back to the City Council if there's any uses out of the fund account for approval by city council. And, and but we could go either way. We could leave it flexible or we could just say <coughs> it's for distressed properties that be on the demo list, which is, Daryl can answer that. How many well, how I, many I don't, I don't have a need to, to tie our hands. I mean, that's, that's not my concern. Right. I, I just, I just feel like distressed property is a, is a pretty vague way of saying something. And I, I didn't, um, obviously, I just saw this amendment now, so I didn't know what the intent was behind it or what, what sort of direction we wanted to take with this. Um, <clears throat> so it's, yeah, I would like, I mean, I don't know, does, I don't know who wrote this amendment. What was the intent behind distrust? Bill Lack would say that so. And again, you know, to try to be very clear on this, these are just sections of the city code that are setting aside money. So you could have a follow-on ordinance similar to what you had done, for example, mm -hmm. with building code fines and violations where you say, here's the program. Well, we have so, a definition section for the, for the land bank ordinance. That's why I'm, I'm wondering if it's, if some sort of language around the intent behind distressed property could be included in definitions. Or do you feel that it, we're okay with just leaving it? No, I, and again, trying to be super helpful here. It is you are, broad, and I think, it I is broad. You. It, it is broad language. So that is not, that's allowing the council, if there's a follow on ordinance, to spend the money to create a program where you would define how far you want that to go. For example, it may not uh, be a lot of money, therefore mm -hmm. there's a limitation on what could be done. But I uh, thought the, the, the next step would be that a program would be created somewhat similar to like the cannabis program for residential or the program for outside TIF areas or the program for mm -hmm. TIF areas where you might designate how any funds from the land bank would be used. So you'd set out a program. Okay. Or maybe it could be lumped in with one of those. I, I'm not sure. It would be a council decision on how to spend the money. I think if, if anything, it should be, I, I would actually not want to have all the funds go into one of those programs or the other. Just, I mean, I, we have distressed properties throughout the city. I think it should be available throughout the city, but I just wasn't clear on what the... That's the intent. <clears throat> What's the intent? Throughout the city, not just one area. Okay. And, and it, this does not have a geographic limitation where it's said only in a certain area. Right. So uh, again, I, I would anticipate there would be a follow-on ordinance at some point. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Alderman Gregory. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, you know, reading this, I think this is a, a, a very good intended use for, for this land bank 
and 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 how I'm understanding is a you know anything in our land bank is something that the city would already own. Am I am I correct with that? In that Mr. Zirkel or or would have the and, properties that we own. And again, Pardon? that would be uh, trying to be very crystal clear. I think that would be subject to the council's adoption of a program on how to spend the money. Remember, this is just Cold. setting it up. So then, depending on the money that comes in, then you would make a decision on how to apply it. Sounds good. Thank you. Alderman Donlin. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. You know, we had a considerable amount of discussion last week about <coughs> the, the governance and how it would be structured. And I, I, uh, I know this is just up for discussion, so, but is there a, another amendment coming that would address some of those issues that were brought up last week? Mayor? As far as uh, further discussions with the uh, Realtors Association, mm -hmm. uh, we offered that to them to, this is just phase one, setting up the framework. So that would be the intent is anything past this, we would have those discussions with the capital area real Realtors and move forward in that direction. So there, there, is, there isn't an, another amendment already like being considered or drafted? Correct, not okay. this time. This was the only one. Alderman Hanauer. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess, uh, is, are we going to have anything in our language that says if, a, if, if, uh, uh, if they've got plans? Uh, my concern is, okay, we're going to have the Housing uh, co Commission set what we're wanting to do with these certain properties. I could see, you know, I could see similar <laughs> to what happened over at Enos Park where they were limited what um, properties could be used for where that's the reason why they didn't sell. Are we going to have anything in there that if these have not, based on the, the whatever conditions they put on them, if they haven't sold within a certain period of time, those conditions go off and it, it gets sold. It goes out to market. Because, again, we're taking these off the tax rolls. And then a lot of times, and as you have said, we've gotten them while they were off the tax rolls. Our goal is to get them back on the tax rolls. And um, my concern is this is going to add more conditions to the lots or whatever, um, to uh, what they can be used for or, you know, you might have a house that, that people think that it can be, be they want it to be uh, re, rejuvenated or whatever, but once the bill, once they get in, it needs to be, you know, it doesn't cost, it's, it's not cost effective. And then what happens? Then you got to, you got to fight between, the housing authority and the, the, the new owner or whatever. Uh, we we got to look at that. But I, I think we got to have some condition in this to where it, we got to sell these lots. We have to sell these lots. Holding on to them and thinking we're going to have one big neighborhood or something like that, we'll be holding on these things for 30 years. And and in the meantime, we're off the off the tax rolls. And and we owe it to the taxpayers to get these on the tax rolls as fast as we can. And if we sell them for $500 to the neighbor and they use it as an extended yard, they're paying the taxes on it. And if they don't follow our codes, they're going to pay the penalties on it too. <clears throat> I'm just concerned that we're going to have, we're going to delay the sale of these things. And, and like they said, it was 15 a year, something like that. As many as we have, it'll take, or no, is can't remember, is it going to take 15 years based on the number of uh, that we've sold per year. So we've got to figure something out to increase that number to a heck of a lot more and not reduce that number. My concern is we're going to reduce that number and we're not going to see these things go. So that's my biggest concern about this whole thing. Yeah, on that, uh, I'll just use the uh, Springfield project as one of the examples, you know, they came up with a plan. It actually was in the paper the other day, or I think it was yesterday, with regards to 11th to 18th South Crandon Cook. That's the target area they looked at with the Q5 initiative or Chamber of Commerce. And so they had the plan, but no resources to implement it. So finally, we're trying to identify resources moving that direction. We have the tip that 
finally was extended by this city council to go that geographic boundary. So what we would do is identify some of the properties that already been identified to match with that plan. And those that aren't useful for the corridors or housing development and fill development, you would go ahead and auction those off um, and then move in that direction. I'd ask Amanda to come forward. She could speak to the uh, specifics of, you know, that process. The other part is with regards to Zenas Park, we talked about this with the medical district in that area. It's the same situation. You have uh, plans for a medical district or for Enos Park, and uh, we need to assess those properties as quickly as possible to determine which ones would be utilized based on those plans or the corridor development, and those that aren't, you just put them up for sale. Well, and, and, and I, I respect the having the plans and everything, <clears throat> but sell it to the companies and let them start paying the taxes and take care of them. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't hold on to them for, the, for the, these companies that want to do these nice developments and stuff they need to buy it if they want to do the development they should be picking these up instead of the city you know it's no different than when you do development any in any other part of the city they have to buy the property in order to do the development right that's the preference but what we want to prevent is from somebody doing speculative buying and just holding them and then that just disrupts the whole process and that's what's happened previously but I'd ask Amanda to come up and uh, she might, I'm not sure if she has the numbers as far as how many have been sold or that process um, associated with the selling of the properties. You had numbers last week, Amanda. I'm yeah, sorry. It, I knew it was, I remember I said it was about 15 years before we get rid of them all. Yeah, so I think, I, I think you there know, been. I think there were 72 that were sold since 2019. I had Linda run those numbers and I think I gave it to the members <coughs> of the council. Uh, and and, and that's course, through that process, Amanda, that you do. Yeah, we, I mean, we did see a downturn, obviously, during COVID. I mean, that certainly had an effect on, on the sale property. There's no question about that. Um, but as far as the process goes, it, it is on an application basis. We do have an RFP that is active and out there. It is good for two years. We do accept those applications um, throughout that period, and then we um, update the list accordingly. So... The 110 <coughs> properties, for example, that we acquired last year um, have just been moved from acquisition into active surplus through our database. And so we'll be updating that list and putting those properties back out so that we can get those back on. But I think this, again, comes back to transformation and revitalization of our city. And this land bank and the folks that will be associated with it will actually do, I think, the opposite. Of, of instead of slowing it down, I actually think it'll speed it up because it's going to allow us to strategize and come together and get this map and have these folks at the table to go and potentially do exactly that, get developers in to say, what can we do to affect the positive change in our community to get these vacant lots that we frankly have right now back on the tax base? And, and I think we will have a lot more, in this case, success in doing that um, with the Housing Advisory Council, with um, some of the, the other folks that would be involved in the land bank process that would, this is a case I think in power, there's power in numbers, truly. Um, less governmental red tape and more streamlining the process to go, where are these lots clustered at? Where can we have some, some sales where we see long-term sustainable change? Um, and potentially even, quite frankly, the ones that are single vacant lots that are adjacent to homes, it may allow for the neighbors for us to go, oh, well, let's find out who lives next door to this vacant property. Are they interested in buying it? I just don't have the time to do that. that's what we so. did. I'm sorry. I thought that's what we did before. Not in the last three years that um, that I've been overseeing the the actual sale, uh, and so I think this would allow for things like that, um, having those folks be able to look at it in economic development as well. I mean, they have direct connections. I think more so to developers and things of that nature than certainly the purchasing department does. And you've got the housing advisory council then too that would be able to help us look at at these things. I, I would like to clarify one thing. I think that Alderman Hanauer mentioned about the taking off the tax rolls. 
one of the problems, and I realize everybody here realizes this, the, this land bank process will not create more properties off the tax roll. The problem we're dealing with is they're coming off the tax roll mm -hmm. through the tax sale. So this will in no way increase that number. What you're trying to do is to get it in a centralized place to try to market it. And one of the issues, just talking briefly about what the realtors brought up, was kind of interesting because if you listen to what they said and then what they provided, although they haven't you know, suggested any amendments yet or anything, is the, the process they were recommending was using that third party, but they would only take a limited number of lots. They won't take 100 lots or 50 lots or 300 lots. They will take a limited number. I think you mentioned 10 or 20. So they still might be a resource, you know, part by part to work with, but they are not even remotely addressing the issue that we're, that's being addressed here <laughs> because they are so limited in number because they can't afford to pay the taxes on hundreds of lots. So if you recall, their, their approach was very targeted. They mentioned that word, very targeted. Alderman Gregory? I would, you know, I, you know we, we spend a, a lot of time on this, and I'm just saying that, you know, a, a, as a ward, you know, a representative of a, of, a, of a ward that has a lot of these, you know, I know we want to sell them quick, and I want to sell them quick, but um, that we have to make sure they're the right fit, too, you know, and, and um, we can sell them all 300, for $300 and get 90 thousand dollars or whatever it is or we can strategically be be um, um, thoughtful about what we want to do and what we want to see we want to grow the tax base I agree with you on that but we want to be that's sort of why we in this position now because you know they have been sold to some people who thought they maybe had idea or, or didn't have idea or didn't know what all it took to to develop these lots and now they're just sitting and you know it's hard to get in get in touch with them and and we got them you know um as well as some houses and things so i, I like this program i like that we're going to dedicate the money back into it to try to you know help out some of these lots and i think you know with this um you know this is the first step and we got a lot of things to do so you know if we can let's let's vote on it and, and send it on through yeah. thank you i appreciate your perspective i don't want to steal anybody's thunder but <laughs> this weekend you know, taking a part in the community connection and walking those streets and going door to door and connecting with the residents personally, myself, um, I was able to see some of those vacant lots, you know, and it really opened your eyes up when you get an boots to the ground, look at that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and frankly, you know, a vast majority of the vacant lots really are in wards two and wards three. And so it'd be really great to, to see some real positive change. And, in the east side and i think um you know Sai joshi is here to do just that right to help in the effort to revitalize the east side so i don't think there's a better time than now to really move this this forward to um really take things uh where they need to be alderman mcminimum amanda long you make a good point that um the intention of all this is to speed up the process of selling the, the properties um and uh, I think that's what we all want to see. Um, this language assigns responsibility for um, making things happen and um, having a constant list of the available properties. And then at the end of the year, we get a summary of the activities. So the assignment of, of accountability is real good here. And then the, um, the new fund that's being created, you know, we're going to put this, these monies in a certain fund. And during the budget process, every fund account has a line item of how it will be spent. So um, we'll know how the money's gonna be spent because it'll have to be on a line item and the budget process will allow this council to, to um, provide the guidance that Alderwoman Conley would like to see on how the money's spent. So I think this is really moving in a positive direction, this uh, proposal. Alderwoman Conley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and the only thing I would ask um, is with the Housing Advisory Council, I did reach out to you. Um, Dean Graven had contacted me that he's not actually serving on, on the Advisory Council okay. since he's on Building and Zoning. And we had that one, ordin one, oh, one right, board right. ordinance. So um, just that position does need to be, his position needs to be filled. Um, someone with a building background, I believe that was the spot he was, mm -hmm. he was okay. filling. So um, I, I, I will still say, I. I think everything in here is, is admirable. It's what we should be doing. 
as we said last week, Mayor, I think you could do all of this without our input, except maybe designate where the funds go. Um, so looking forward to seeing some more detail and, and, and how we're going to take this to um, a next level. I'd ask uh, Nate Bottom come up if he, um, what all the woman purchased, or I'm sorry, all the woman Conley pointed out previously about distressed, or do you have a uh, better definition for that, or what's your thoughts? Well, in the, in the code, we do reference dilapidated properties That's as well, if you'd like to yeah. use that, too. Dilapidated. I, I think, you know, and I think actually, you know, uh, Mr. Zirkel's suggestion of a, a follow-up ordinance to to provide some more structure around that. Um, like I said, I, I wasn't sure what the term meant exactly, but I think we can brainstorm something and, and put that together. So th thank you, Nate. I know you've got experience with all of that. Any other discussion on the amendment? Is there a motion on the amendment? Make a or motion. Alderman to, McMinimum? Uh, a motion to approve the, I'll make a motion for passage first so that we can then make a motion to amend the, uh, the ordinance. Second. So move and second to uh, move the ordinance for passage. Um, any discussion? Um, and Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to amend the ordinance as introduced to um, to add the language we talked about just now with the uh, fund being created to receive the money from the proceeds. That'd be what's labeled as um, proposed amendment number one on the handout. So I'll make a motion second. to amend with proposed amendment number one. So there's been a motion to approve the ordinance and the amendment, number one. If you would, you, you you first, you would vote on just on the amendment uh, if there's further discussion, but you take them uh, one at a time. So the amendment first? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. So motion on the um, ordinance as amended. You're asking for someone right. to make the motion or asking for a uh, second? For the motion as amended. I move to make a motion to adopt agenda item 2022-435 as amended. Second. Okay, move and second. Any discussion? All those. Alderman Hanauer. Uh, originally, I wasn't going to vote for this, but I'm, I'm going to vote for it with the idea of looking at it at the end of the year and at the end of when we get a report and see where we're at. I still don't see the benefit of this. I, I, other than putting more work on on a department that's already overly overly stressed, um, I, I'm not. I, I don't know. Maybe it's. I'm not seeing how this is going to make things move faster. You're adding more. You're you're adding a committee to something, and any time you add a committee to something, it slows things down. It's not speeding it up. So. I'm willing to vote for this, but I'm going to look at it, you know, pretty hard when we get it back. And and if it's if it doesn't look like it's working, um, then then we'll have to look at, at, at that accordingly. But you got to remember, any property that we sell is going to take a year or so for us to come in to see that, you know, well, tax wise. Keep in mind, we got we got properties that are not getting tax paid. I get it. That's you know, and every person that contacts us, at least I, me, I don't know about anybody else, I get told how much they pay in taxes. And when they know that there's property that's not getting, not having to pay taxes, they're not happy about it. And that's why I'm, I'm so adamant that we got it, we got to have these things going. And, it, and the first thing I would do with these properties is I would have the, if, if this committee's going to do anything, Call the neighbors and see if they want to buy it. That'd be number one. We might be able to get rid of half of them right there. Ralph, I only caution a little bit in that area because just in my my two areas, Lincoln Park, we have some houses that's getting ready to also go on the demolition list. But some people don't want someone buying a, a lot to put like a trailer, even if it's just one trailer on. Do that. So it's like it, we still got to look at. But but it, they still have to abide by our our, our yeah. zoning codes. Yeah, and it, you, they you have say to that, but I got that. a whole issue on Lincoln Park right now where something like that is going on, and somehow it is allowed, and I might be using the wrong term for it, but it doesn't look normal, and the neighbors are very upset about it. 
And so I think that some people, too, just want to make sure that you, if you can put a house on it, that you do put a house on it. That was the whole reason we did it in, uh, in Enos Park, too. We don't want people just buying it and you have every other house or six different lots on that street, just all community gardens. That doesn't help, right? I'm just if trying to figure out. If taxes on it, it, it's better than nothing. Hey, but my concern, one more thing, is okay in like, uh, you know, like Lincoln Park. You may not get a house that's built in the same Capet manner that, that you would, that, that fits that air. Yeah, I understand that. And that's, that's where I'm con concerned that they're going to be, you know, we have about one, things like that. It's one right across the street from me on 6th Street that Mike Pittman built. It doesn't look nothing like the Enos Park structures, and we were okay with it. Alderman Williams. No, call the question. Second. What? Did he say call the question? He said call the question. Okay. <laughs> okay, Roy. All in favor of the uh, ordinance as amended, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just trans transitioned one. Oh, Come Lord. on, Chuck. I'm voting under protest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Roy, you. Roy, don't wait for a question. No more. Thank oh. you. <laughs> we'll have a register vote when she comes back. Is that all right? You can do that. Oh, uh, boy. Nine voting yes, none voting no. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is 2022-454, an ordinance approving a professional services agreement with energy venture analysis in an amount not to exceed 49000 to provide consulting services in relation to the elevation or evaluation and analysis of the coal market for the Office of Public Utilities. Chair will entertain a motion. Place agenda number 2022-454 on final passage. So move. Second. The move and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. Okay. And the ordinance passes eight voting yes and one voting present. Next item on the agenda is 2022-464, an ordinance amending ordinance 426-12-14, establishing Springfield Sangamon County in our Enterprise Zone, Enterprise Zone designation tax abatement and ordinance 425-12-14, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with Sangamon County regarding the enterprise zone by extending the territorial boundaries to include property located at parcels 21-24.0-100-027 and 21-24.0-100-022. Chair Leonard, any motion to place so agenda number 2022-464 in final passage? So been moved and second. Any discussion? All the back minimum. Anyone know where this uh, parcel is located? <coughs> what business is on the it's, property? It's currently at the corner of uh, Mathers Gun Club Road and Cockrell Lane. More on on Mathers Gun Club. Uh, there's a parcel. Oh, uh, before you get to the where the actual gun club was. Uh, there's two parcels there that um, a company is looking at, at a project there. Do we know which company it is? It's uh, Christian Horizons, I think. Is, is that that there? Is that the one? Corporate Council. I know there's two projects out there. Uh, basically, this is this area where it's for, um, uh, I guess it's for re basically retirement development. Right. There's an existing one, and they're trying to expand. Okay, I'm gonna. I don't know too much about this, but what I do know is there's a really great need for retirement homes. In, is this in the city limits right now? Yeah. Yes, sir. And so it's kind of giving away something that we don't have to give away to to make something happen. I mean, the enterprise zone it means no sales tax we paid on materials of construction and that kind of thing. So that's that's the reason for my no vote on this. I think we're just giving away something we don't have to give away to get s something built. So. That's well, you keep in mind it's a $70 million project, um, potentially, and um, with the price of, uh, uh, of, you know, lumber and everything that's gone up, um, hopefully it's not in jeopardy. 
So, Alderwoman Conley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I apologize. I had to leave the room. If I could just reflect that I was a yes on the last two ordinances. It's noted that you're on 2022 435 <coughs> that you voted yes. And and the um, 454, please. 454 also. Thank you. Thank Very you. Good. Any other discussion? Water. All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. <coughs> And the ordinance passes eight voting yes, two voting, or seven. Aaron didn't vote. Okay, I'm a yes on this okay. one, Okay, eight voting yes, two voting no. Chair, I entertain a motion to spend with the rules in place on first reading agenda number 2022-486, ordinance appeal, repealing previously passed ordinance 347-09-10, approving a four-way stop intersection at 4th and Cedar Street. Motion. Motion. So moved. Good movement. Second, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to spend with the rules in place on first reading agenda number 2022-487, an ordinance authorizing the acceptance of two grants and the execution of the respective grant agreements with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in connection with the fis city's fiscal year 2022 annual action plan to accept $1,338,665 in community development block grant entitlement award and three, $698,331 in home investment partnership program funds for a total of $2,036,996 for the Office of Planning and Economic Development. So we'll so second. We'll move and second. Any discussion? All in favor of motion say aye. 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 Opposed aye. say nay. Motion carries. Is there any unfinished business come before the council? Is there any new business come before the council? We have a couple of announcements. One is uh, this Saturday is the Pumpkin Smash, uh, November 5th, from 1 to 4 on Washington Street between 5th and 6th Street. All ages are welcome to bring their pumpkins and gourds to smash, stomp them, all for composting. Uh, the event will happen rain or shine. And then there's curbside pit branch pickup, which begins this Monday, November 7th, in the Northwest Quadrant. The schedule is preset, and each neighborhood will receive one curbside branch pickup. Details are on the city's website at springfield.il.us. And then the six-week yard waste drop-off is uh, now until December 10th. Residents can drop off their yard waste without a fee to Evans Recycling, which is on 2100 J. David Jones Parkway. And then last tonight is the final... Uh, Last flight uh, of honor uh, with regards to uh, the veterans that are coming from Washington, D.C., and that should arrive somewhere between 9.30 and 10 o'clock at Capitol Airport to welcome home our veterans. Alderman Gregory. I just want to say real quickly, um, you know, I can't leave without what I'll say, and thank you uh, um, to Miss Julia, um, um, our, our Harvard fellow, and, uh, you know, all of our departments, you know, they got out this weekend and, they, and you know, one of our poorest and more, most distressed um, or dilapidated or whatever words we want to use areas and, uh, you know, got a, got a lot of work done, you know, a lot of trees cut down, a lot of alleys um, cut all, you know, sort of a blitz all at once. And, and the community there was appreciated of it. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, I went, went around the area and, you know, they was really pleased, you know, with some trees and some alleys that, you know, they felt like haven't been cut in years. So, so I, I just want to extend my thank you to everyone for just taking the time and, and, uh, you know, doing that. So hats off to you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Alderman Hanauer. Yeah, Mayor, um, along with the, uh, the, the leaf pickup and that, I wanted to thank uh, Adina. I, I had to get her involved. I had a letter from a gentleman that lives out in uh, Centennial Park, and apparently when he contacted Evans, they don't have an updated map or something, and said that they weren't in the city, so they couldn't bring their leaves. We had to, had to adjust some things, so um, uh, I wanted to thank if, if you could thank her for me, I'd, I'd appreciate it because she, she contacted the gentleman, and I think we got to make sure that Evans knows all the, all the parts of the city because um, people go out there, and if you're taking your leaves out, make sure you, I guess there's two avenues. You could come down downtown, correct, <coughs> Daryl? You can come downtown and get it right. certain colored. 
tag or you can take your CWLP bill to Evans and they prove your, that you live in the city. So thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Is there anybody signed up to speak? Um, yes. Uh, Charlotte Johnson. Hey, you back in just in time. I'm Seth and I should get in here. Hello. Good evening. I'm moving a little slow. Every day we get back in the day in the winter, especially. especially the knee you didn't do. Oh God! But thank you. It's good to see you back. This one may take. That's the main thing I want to say in the car, but you know, I can wing it after 44 years. I think I can get my point across. Just give me a minute. That's right. Pain is, uh, winters here are not real good. That's why I want to move uh, just for a minute. Damn. Illinois, I'm going to pray for some better weather. Okay. Two winters is, uh, okay. Deep breath. Okay. Good evening, Council. It's good to see you. You too. My name is Charlotte Louise Johnson. I am the retired city of Springfield, Illinois, Office of Public Utilities Regulatory Affairs Managers. So that means I work for the big kahuna. Boy, there'd be some stuff going on up there. But I appreciate it because it was good skill. But uh, I'm retired right now. First off, I want to tell everybody that, to remind you, I retired under Mayor Mike Houston, started under Mike Houston. So remember that anything I do for you is voluntary. Can't charge you. Don't need to. Thank you for that, boy, that, that pension. If you stay here 34 years, hard work, but it's worth it. I loved it. So um, what I want to say this evening, first I want to greet you all, and I, seriously, and I want you to be safe, and there's a lot of things going on, and uh, I remind you that politics is federal, state, local. So a lot of the things going on we cannot control. So what I want to see us do, and remind you, I've always been nonpartisan. Ooh, and boy, I think the more part nonpartisan you get, the more they don't understand. I said I'm staying nonpartisan. So that means please don't call me, folks, because uh, I'm just going to cut you off just like I cut my family off. Bye, bye, bye. That's how you do it. That's how you stay nonpartisan. You have to hook back up a little bit just to see what's going on with the family, but I don't even talk to my family. Because my desire is to see this city remember that we are Lincoln's hometown, first and foremost. Well, Springfield, we're special, y'all. Yeah. So let's not get caught up in it. I mean, I, starting here as a spokesperson for the utility, I don't even recognize it sometimes. And by the way, I'm always an ambassador for the city. That's what that is. I like to, you know, come on in. Let's do it. Come on. But we're going to be a community after this. So, uh, and you know, first off, I want to remind you, I've only come before the council four times in my life on my own. Because of my business, I work on the executive side. Everybody like me because, you know, I have my stuff in order and I can, you know, help you. And when I worked here, there's small offices. We help each other. And I think sometimes that's what's missing. Everybody's just so selfish. And I've tried to analyze it every way because I saw it in the beginning when we were teen. And I don't understand this. Well, I know the Bible says mother, but can we get back to some civility? 
That's what I'm asking. And when I say that, I know that I'm registered so people will listen. I look at it and I say, what happened to us? The teamwork. The, after all of this race is settled down, I don't know that there's a Democrat or Republican in the up yonder. So you, they can come at me and they won't because I'm a devout Christian first. And I want this to be a community afterwards. And that's what I say to everybody. Settle down. In fact, I tell people, quit acting like a heathen and shut up and pray. Because that's how bad this is. I have no interest in kids getting killed. And our police kids, just, you know, these are our kids. And now we got kids killing each other. Folks on drugs. Stealing from their mamas. You know what I tell them? I'll turn you in faster than the popo. Steal your mom. Uh -uh, we're not going to do that. We're a community. So I guess what I'm asking is, and I'm sorry, because basically, to tell you the truth, every community is out gun. These guns are coming in here from St. Oh, and believe me, I do watch crime across the country. So I know what's going on across the country before it gets in here. I'm that skilled. And that's fine. Because I believe knowledge and getting ahead of something helps you to do it, to deal with Point of order, Ms. Johnson. So, okay, excuse me. Just point of order. We try to limit okay, these to five minutes. Well, I can tell you that I am an employee of the city of Springfield because I am on the commission for the senior citizens, so I believe it says that I can speak a little longer because I am approved with the advice and consent of the council. So I will wrap it up, but I took a lot of effort to get here, and I'd appreciate a little consideration because I'm going to be leaving. I won't overindulge my time, but I think the life of our community and getting this down is, uh, and I, my life has been threatened too, so I think that should give me a little bit. Let's just come together for a community, and I appeal to everybody out there. But when I'm on the federal hate list and somebody's trying to kill me, things have gotten out of order because this is the first time that I've ever in my 65 years, my life's been threatened. So what I'm saying to you is this is serious to everybody. And I think Alderman um, Redpath knows probably is, you know, it's just serious. So I said, let's take it seriously. Have you so to thank you. Chief and Scarlett? please protect me. Because yep. I just want to get out of here. I'm not trying to get in. I've already served my time. So if you would uh, afterwards figure out how you can protect me better, I'd appreciate it. Thank okay. you. And thank, thank you, you for your indulgence, sir. <laughs> thank you. Is there a motion for adjournment? Mr. Oh, okay. Mayor, there's one other item. Oh, okay. Yeah, I apologize. I, um, we had, uh, and, and again, we don't have to address this tonight, but the clerk and I, okay. as are we required to do, uh, have been periodically reviewing the executive session minutes. Uh, I think you may recall that we had talked about it uh, some time ago. Uh, each member has the uh, right or authority to go and review minutes, you know, listen to the tapes of executive sessions and so on. And we have to make a periodic recommendation and uh, to whether or not to maintain the confidentiality of the executive session minutes. So it is the recommendation of Corporation Council and, and also the uh, clerk's office that we go ahead and maintain the uh, confidentiality of the existing executive session minutes, keeping in mind it is subject to if any member ever wants to go and listen to them or otherwise bring it up, then you're free to do so at any time. So we are required to make that recommendation by statute periodically. So, uh, and we don't, if there's discomfort, we don't have to vote on it this evening. It's not an ordinance. It's just a uh, recommendation and a motion. And we could uh, take it up at the next meeting if you would prefer. So uh, purely, uh, I wanted to mention it. I'd sent an email, I think, last week addressing it. And if there are specific questions, happen, you know, uh, happen to, uh, happy to talk with you about it. Do it now. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we accept this recommendation. Second. And move and second to accept the recommendation regarding executive session minutes. Any discussion? 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Is there a motion for adjournment? Motion so moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed aye. say nay. We're adjourned. Thank you.